Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are joined by Vince Melamed. He is a storied man and a multi-talent. There are a lot of things that he's done. You could say he's a hit songwriter, a recording artist, a keyboardist, a session musician. These days, he's a voiceover artist. And Vince Melamed, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Nice to be here. Honored to have you. Vince, do you have a joke? Yeah, it's a nice family joke. <laughs> I just heard this today. Okay. Uh, he says, how much do you charge a pirate for ear earrings? I mean, for uh, ear piercing. Hmm. How much? A buccaneer. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> I like the corny ones. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, Vince. Yeah. Great to have you with us here. What have you been doing with your time mostly these days? Mostly doing voiceover or auditioning for voiceover, I should say. It's a very competitive market. It's kind of like if I just uh, was playing guitar for three years, decided to move to Nashville and become a guitarist, you know, as if there's no one else already doing this. And I imagine being in the times of, of COVID, Yes. There's many, many people who maybe have transitioned back into this kind of work because you can do it exactly. remotely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I was lucky because I had an advantage because um, I have a, a, a little recording setup already and I can do remote recording and I can drop in video. Sometimes I do dubbing for like Korean uh, video games or something. I can drop it in and do it all here without them worrying about going to a studio. And it's better than for me driving to Burbank to do something in the middle of traffic and get there an hour and a half, in an hour and a half, completely shaking. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So have you always had this ability to speak to, you have a very crisp voice and everybody can go to VinceMelamed.com. You also have the ability to do characters. Yeah. I always do characters. I was a mimic as a kid. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that came natural. And, and even when I moved to Nashville um, in the mid 80s, I started getting a little bit of voiceover work, which was always a refreshing change from doing music and always worrying about the songwriting and all that. So when you were growing up, what mm -hmm. was it that you wanted to do? Well, when I was four years old, I think I wanted to be a uh, archaeologist. <laughs> but now my mom was a, was a frustrated, uh, never got to be a performer, and she was a ham bone. And so we would all gather around the piano and sing. And so I said, I want to I want to play piano. And uh, so that got me started. And uh, even in kindergarten, we used to set up these big blocks, uh, these big building blocks. And there's three of us, and we would try to get the attention of girls by singing you know the hits of the day like shaboom <laughs> stuff <laughs> like that so i think i always was a ham bone wanted to be in entertainment well you were just mentioning the the hits of the day and i'm curious what was the music when you were growing up that you most identified with the, the music that you loved the most growing up me let's say when i was 10 9 10 11 or yeah, and then well, into your teen years. Okay. Well, uh, I started out uh, listening to the pop radio, uh, and that would be the late 50s. And so there was still a lot of the doo-wops. Uh, there was the Frankie Avalons and all that. I didn't uh, listen so much to that. That was more for little teenage girls, little teeny bobbers, we used to call them. But as I grew older, my brother was three years older than me, and he... And then we moved to California when I was 10. And he started going to places like Pandora's Box on the Sunset Strip, where this was before it was rock and roll. It was beatniks, reading poetry and playing bongos and all that. So he would come back uh, buying Joan Baez albums and buying some jazz albums as well. So I started uh, moving over to more R&B, folk music, and uh, a little bit of jazz. And then the Beatles. And then the Beatles. <laughs> and then the Beatles. Yes. Well, I see. I was in a 
when I was about 13, uh, 14, I joined a little surf band. And I was, oh, I had already moved to LA from New York. And um, so we were playing instrumentals because everything was surf music, especially in LA. But um, then the Beatles came and boom, everyone started doing vocals. You had to think about writing and look, get a little more serious about your music. So then I switched over to, uh, to R&B, British rock, all that. Excuse me, I've got the heater on. Let me turn it off. Um, so I have a, a, a div quite a diverse um, influences were going around. And we had clubs like the Ashgrove and you could go see uh, uh, Lightning Hopkins and uh, Mississippi John Hurt and uh, Fred McDowell and, and all that. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. So many clubs and then our band, little surf band I was with, um, I got an audition to uh, for Catalina Sportswear. They were putting together the youth, the teen youth of uh, 1965. And so I auditioned and I got the gig. I was the keyboard player and singer and we got a record deal. And it, so it was quite a trip to be 16 years old and sign a record deal. And then 17, uh, I kind of left left high school for two days to go on a tour, you know? And in those days, the touring was basically half the time you were lip syncing. Mm. They put your record on and there's a, a live audience and you're lip syncing. But I you know, opened up for groups like the, the Left Bank and for Love and B.B. King and all that, you know, very diverse. It was. And how were your parents feeling about all of this ah. well it's funny since my mom was a groupie and a frustrated uh, performer she my parents would always say you know uh you can do all this and get it out of your system you know, when by the time you leave high school but i got a record deal when i was 16 and all of a sudden my mom said well you know <laughs> i guess you can continue <laughs> mm -hmm. so uh they were very much against it. Man, you know, my dad was going was telling me, uh, you know, he's a World War II uh, soldier and all that. You know, well, you know, we've got the war coming on, and you know, you're going to go in the army and all that stuff. But the, everything changed uh, as the years went on into the '60s, and you know, everyone's viewpoints and all that kind of softened, moved a little to the left. Hmm. So during this time, what? What are maybe some of your memories of the Sunset Strip? Oh, it was great because I got to play most of those clubs. Uh, there was there were little clubs like the Sea Witch uh, and uh, the Trip. So what my band used to do was you we knew that on the Sunset Strip, this would be when we're I'm 16 or 17. So this is 1965, 66. We knew that on Wednesdays, the bands would change out. So if Paul Butterfield was playing the whiskey, they come in on Wednesday and do sound check. So we would leave school at three o'clock. We, we didn't touch school. We left school at 3.15 and went to the whiskey and we'd watch Van Morrison, uh, the, uh, you know, Butterfield. We'd go to a club called The Trip and the birds were playing there. And we used to knock on the, the cellar, it was kind of a two and a half story, three story building. And the cellar, uh, we'd go down the steps and knock on the door and Crosby, David Crosby would let us in because we were, the, the Whiskey A Go-Go was a county, LA County club and we were way too young at 16, 17. You had to be 18 to get into a county club. So we got to see, you know, the birds, got to see Andy Warhol and the Velvet Underground and Warhol was there showing having about eight or 10 different movie screens with projectors showing stuff while the Velvet Underground played and all that. And uh, it was a great time, great time. Got to play clubs like Beto Lido's, which were little hideaways, but groups like Spirit would, would, would get, you know, that's where you always play in the beginning. We'd open for Love, which is a very influential group in Los Angeles. And uh, it was a wonderful time. It was great to just be around it all. Can you remember the first time you went into a recording studio? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When would that have been? 
1964, um, there was a family, and I, I can't remember, they may have been the Thompsons that originally signed the Beach Boys and, and Candix records. And somehow that was our first, we were, I don't know how they reached out to us. They probably saw us playing at a party or something. And we got to record at a little studio across the street from uh, Paramount. And they had us record two sides. And they were just this little little couple, little like 55 or 60 years old. And they had just, they released the first two sides of the Beach Boys. And then Capital made them a deal they couldn't refuse. And they lost. And I hope they made some money. But I remember recording and just completely in awe of you know the equipment. Would pro probably in those days there were rotary knobs and all that in, in the control room. But we had to stop recording because Paramount Studios caught on fire across the street. So I vividly still that's how I remember my first time recording because you know stopping going outside and seeing this build this entire complex in flames and all that. Mm. And I. Oh, I was just going to say that what influenced me to want to be in a band was around 62 and 3, my brother was a big surfer. And I tried surfing and I just wasn't interested. But we used to go to a club. My parents or, or there was a group of five or six of us. We'd go to a club called the Dovell Castle down on Pacific Coast Highway. And that's where I was influenced. There would be, and there were white kids, there were surfer kids. There was Latino kids and there were black kids. And it generally was surfing bands, which was interesting that that, that would appeal to that you know, diverse group of, of cultures. But I used to walk right up to the stage and look up. The stage was probably about five or six feet high. And I would look up and just watch those guys playing. And I went, that's what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> There's a movie that I have seen, believe it or not, mm -hmm. that you wrote a song for, and I'm talking about Riot on Sunset Strip. Yeah. Tell yeah. us about that. Um, well, the funny thing was Riot, uh, the quote Riot on Sunset Strip happened in the fall of 66. And I had a date. I was just starting to drive. And I had a date that lived in a valley. I remember going up, picking her up, and saying, well, let's go down Laurel Canyon, and we'll go to the Strip. And all of a sudden, there's a big traffic jam and police and all that. I got stuck in the middle of, of the uh, quote, you know, Sunset Strip Riot. But when we got a record deal, we were produced by Mike Curb, and Mike Curb was responsible for the music um, for Riot on Sunset Strip. And what we did was we really were just about through with Mike and we really didn't like the movie and we didn't like what, what was going on. It was all exploitation, so we did this funny song called Sunset Sally and that and that got us off the off the, off the label but I did uh, sing there's a movie called Mondo Hollywood I don't know if you ever heard of that no Mondo yeah. Hollywood's a weird documentary um, it's when I first learned about quote virtual or reality shows TV shows how how staged they were and uh, it was supposed to be like the big movie was Mondo Connie 64, where it was just scenes of, uh, it was for shock value, you know, if they see a dog getting his head cut off or something, you know, it, mm. it's a weird Italian film that's supposed to be art. Um, so somehow they had us stage a, a, a BM acid party <laughs> and film this. So I got to sing the, um, the, the title <laughs> track of that, of that movie. It was terrible. <laughs> well i appreciate your honesty <laughs> yeah because we were we were little hipsters we were going you know we graduated school and i we play our band the mugwumps we played at um the first graduation of uh of the first uh class graduating class at pacific palisades pally high and then drove up to the monterey pop festival so, you know, we were part of the culture and this movie was just an insult to us. Those, all those movies that, you know, pretended like they were part of the scene and all that. Mm. So when you started with the songwriting, 
were you mm. primarily somebody who wrote by yourself or someone who had a collaborator? It started out by myself, yeah. And then when I moved to Nashville, I learned about collaborating. When did you move to Nashville? In 1985, which was a great time to come to Nashville. Because they were uh, shaking off the, uh, the terrible urban cowboy period, which was the early 80s. And um, they were kind of, I was lucky because I was coming from California, which then was a novelty. There weren't many Calif Los Angelinos coming to Nashville yet by 85. And luckily, about six months before, I got a call uh, from my friend Josh Leo, who was already in Nashville. He's an LA boy, and he was in uh, J.D. Souther's band with me. And he was getting some success in Nashville. And he called me up. He said, come down to Nashville for three and a half weeks and play in Roseanne Cash's band. Um, and I said, ah, uh -uh, I'm not going to Nashville for three and a half weeks. So he put Roseanne on the phone and Roseanne, she goes, hey, I was, I was born in Ventura, California. Rodney and I'll show you a good time. We'll show you a good part of Nashville and all that. I said, okay. And I was lucky because I had just played with Bob Dylan, uh, did a record it, re rehearsed for three and a half weeks and recorded about 20 songs and two ended up <laughs> on albums. And I also had played with the Eagles live just on one song, but I'm on the Eagles live album. And it was a wonderful time for me to come to Nashville because I came in with Roseanne, who represented the left of center country. We, I got to be in this band. They're used to, do you, are you familiar with who Harlan Howard was? Oh yeah. Yeah, well Harlan Howard used to have birthday bashes every September. So I got to be in the house band the first year and we'd back up every country artist, everyone from, you know, the most stead legends to, to the new left, like Roseanne and Emmylou Harris and all that stuff. And Vince, Vince Gill was still trying to make it as a uh, solo artist, but he was in Roseanne's band as well. So it was a great time to be in there. And, and doors could open for me because of, luckily because of my recent credits. That's when I learned about writing. And, and uh, there was a fellow I see that you interviewed Pam Tillis. Correct, yes. Yeah, she had a, a, a publishing deal in 85, and her publisher said, Vince, I'm going to lock you in this room with uh, Pam, and you can't come out till you have, write a song. Hmm. And I'm from L.A., you know, well, we've got to put the drum machine on, and, you know, well, my Prophet Five's not here, <laughs> that kind of stuff. And it was a great experience. Oh, Pam is a brilliant, brilliant writer. So hmm. it, that's when I really started uh, co-writing. So I imagine with the experiences that you had, you know, mm -hmm. so who have you worked with, Vince? Well, a little with Bob Dylan, Eagles. <laughs> Were people's eyes really, you know, wow, okay. Yeah, but I was old enough to know that you're only good as the last thing you do. So, you hmm. know, it, it was great, you know. But And it depends, if, you know, some people I'd say Dan Fogelberg or Jimmy Buffett, whoever, Rita Coolidge, you know, anything, you know. But that, I didn't really want to become a keyboard player. And uh, I was play, still with Jimmy Buffett's band back then. And then I was in Roseanne's band, which was a lot of fun. Uh, so it was a great time in, in, in their mid eighties. Um, I just started becoming a songwriter and we used to have a thing. It's not like now where, where uh, everybody's office is this, you know, business office. Now it used to, all the, all the great music publishers and recording companies were on music row in these old Victorian houses that they, uh, you know, fixed up as, as offices. And you could come in and play a song you know, say, oh, I've got the, you know, if they know you and all that. So um, in those days, they would have a, a meeting every month. This only lasted for about six months. And the heads of RCA, Capital, Warners, you know, whatever, would have a meeting with writers. And there was, you know, maybe seating for 75 writers. And each guy would say, okay, here's my new artist. And this is what I'm looking for which was a wonderful, what an experience. It was like being back in college, 
you know, mm. and having a fraternity of guys that you hang out with, you know, it was wonderful. Hmm. Well, on the note of your, your credits, I, I had to write them down. Um, I, <laughs> just for the people who are watching, I want to, I want to read, and this is just a snapshot. Vince Melamed, he has recorded with Bob Dylan, recorded and toured with Jimmy Buffett, Dan Fogelberg, Glenn Fry, Bobby Womack. He's worked with Eagles, Andy Kaufman, Rita Coolidge, J.D. Souther, Roseanne Cash. Lots of voiceover work. His songs have been recorded by Trisha Yearwood, Ty Herndon, Phil Vassar. He's also managed to record his old own album, we should mention, What Matters Most, which I really enjoyed. And I, I have to say, do a lot of people compare that album to Eagles kind of California music? Uh, no. Uh, no? To, to be honest, not too many people have heard that album <laughs> where it would give me that comment. Um, it's funny you say that. I never thought of that. Um, it's not as guitar heavy as Eagles stuff. Right. Yeah. And it's a little more. Yeah. And plus the singing by uh, Don and Glenn is much better than mine. It, it, a friend of mine from L.A. had moved to Nashville and wanted to form a label and sign writers that people had not heard of and and uh, and make a compilation album. So I, I did walk away, Joe, on that. But then he said, well, let's do a full album because we had a lot of fun. So no, I wish more people had heard the album and I wish I could have re-recorded it knowing now what I know about doing your own album and your limitations and all that. Hmm. Well, anybody who wants to, they can check that album out. It's on Spotify and it's on yeah. Apple Music. So give that a listen. Tell me about, you, you were mentioning uh, about the, the time you spent with Bob Dylan. Mm. How did you come to encounter him? My friend Ira, uh, the, there's a guitarist in, and a producer in LA, Ira Ingber, and his brother, Elliot, was one of the founding members of the Mothers of Invention. He was in uh, he was in Fraternity of Man. He wrote and sang the song Don't Bogart That Joint. He was in Captain Beefheart. Um, Ira was good friends with Bob Dylan's road manager. And Dylan had just finished a great album um, with Mark Knopfler. Gosh, and I can't remember the name of the album. Yeah, I know uh, that album. Yeah, it's a wonderful album. And so he's always thinking of changing, doing this and that. And the road manager friend of Ira's called Ira up and said, um, put together a band and meet at, here's Bob's address and show up for rehearsal. So that, you know. So of course we show up at, at his house in Trancus, uh, in the Trancus area, I can't remember exactly. And, and it's a, he's got a whole room uh, that's uh, was set up with, you know, what what instruments do you need, this and that, and it was all there for me. And of course, he was two, uh, two hours late to show up. So we're just hanging around. We don't, you know, we're just hanging around. We're tuning up, and uh, we all knew each other, all the musicians, so we were just goofing around. And he finally comes in. He comes in dressed like Bob Dylan. <laughs> He's got the striped pants. He's got a, 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 a jean jacket. And he just comes in, just kind of, when I first saw him, he reminded me of Stan Laurel because he came in, you know, kind of scratching his head, you know, just kind of nodded us, picked up a guitar and just started playing. Didn't say hello, he started playing. So we start following him because everything with him is very, you know, of the moment, impromptu and, you know. So after about an hour of playing music, he finally stopped and he said, uh, he said, any of you guys uh, ever been sued for plagiarism? And I went, oh, I said, no. And he said, yeah, uh, I wrote a song called Blowing in the Wind. And I felt like saying, oh, really, Bob? How does that song go? I've never heard it. And that was his first tidbit of, of uh, conversation with us. And Interesting. He, you know, yeah. It was intimidating for me because that was one of my teenage idols, Bob Dylan. I had a, our band, the Mugwumps, would play Stax Volt music, like Otis Redding and Sam and Dave. And we also could almost play the entire Blonde on Blonde album. And people still hired us. 
<laughs> so you, you said it was intimidating to be around him. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, you see the movie Don't Look Back and you're scared to say, because he'll come in and go, uh, uh, what'd you think of that song? And Ira will go, oh, I liked it. He goes, oh, really? I hated it. And, you know, leave it at that. Don't even start because you could see and don't look back. He can cut you to, you know, yeah. to master of words. So uh, there was a song that we cut called, uh, it originally was Danville Girl and it became Brownsville Girl. He wrote the lyrics with Sam Shepard. And we cut it and it was an 11 and a half minute song. So everyone in the band goes out to lunch and I'm stuck. And Bob uh, is still in the studio. I didn't want to have lunch. And Bob says, he says, uh, I want to do the vocal again. So the engineer says, you come in here and sit <laughs> with me. I said, okay. He does the whole thing and he goes, how is that? And, the, and he finishes and the engineer looks at me and goes, oh, I'm not going to touch this. And I said, oh, I, I, think, uh, I think you can do another one. And he goes, oh, really? Why? And I went, oh, no, no, no. I said, I don't know. I think you could just do it better. I went, okay. And sweating bullets, you know, me saying, oh, God, it's going to turn into, oh, really? Well, what did you think of, you know, <laughs> but he was, uh, so he was kind of like that, you know, he's he very strange. And like I said, he was my idol. It'd be, you know, I, I was speechless whenever he was around, you know, wish I wasn't, I wish I would have said more, but I was like 34 years old and <laughs> still had a lot to learn. So the two albums from Bob Dylan that you appear on, <laughs> Empire Burlesque, Yes. Uh -huh. Knocked out and loaded. Yes. What do you think of those recordings? Uh, they, they, unfortunately, that was the worst, worst Bob Dylan period. Yeah. And the funny thing is, on uh, Empire Burlesque, it was just a four-piece band. And uh, it was great. It was so much fun. Um, we had no idea where each song was going. So that's why you hear a lot of sloppiness in Dylan tracks, you know, because... He doesn't say, here comes the chorus. He, we would rehearse and he'd go, I suppose this was a song after playing for 30 minutes, you know. So uh, we did four, four piece band plus Bob doing uh, so, uh, one of the songs on uh, Knocked Out Loaded. And then, oh, I'm sorry. It was, it was for Knocked Out Loaded and it was the 12 minute song. And we did it as a four or five piece band. And then the album comes out two years later, and all of a sudden there's horns. There are all these backup singers go, oh, yeah, and 10,000 guitars. And I was like, why? Hmm. I'm done. You don't need to. So it was a weird period of his, of his creativity. I wish I could have played on the album before that Knopfler did. And I wish I could. No, can't remember that title. Anyway. I also want to get a bit of the background that you have with Jimmy Buffett. You uh, toured with him in, I think, 86, 87, 83 1988? To 88. 83 to 88. Yeah? Uh-huh. Okay. How did you come to meet Jimmy Buffett? When I was with J.D. Souther, we would open up for Jimmy Buffett. And, and we were amazed because none of us really knew, knew about Jimmy Buffett. But he would pack these. He play, we, we were playing colleges and just... All these kids knew all the songs and this and that. Um, and Josh Leo, again, was guitarist was with J.D. Souther. He was more outgoing than I, and he ended up coming out and jamming with the guys on the last song, jamming with Buffett. He'd stay backstage while I was out doing whatever, you know, looking at girls or something. But Josh would always have his guitar by his side, and he ended up, this was a formal, you know, a formal thing where every night at the end he'd come out and jam with them. So he ended up in Buffett's band, and Josh, being very aggressive, to his great credit, just he said, "I'm going to write a song and put it on Buffett's album." So he said, "Vince, will you play synthesizers on it?" And we went into a studio, and it was just Josh and myself, and I did like about five or six synth parts. Gives it to Jimmy. Jimmy likes the song. He goes, "Yeah, but," uh, and Mike Utley his keyboard player for years and years is an excellent keyboard player. But I don't think at that time he was familiar with, with synthesizers and it was all the Prophet 5, I think, that I was using. So he said, well, uh, just get that guy come in and, and play all the parts, you know? So I came in, um, got friendly and with him and, and everybody, and uh, 
was called to do the next, uh, starting the, with the tours in the summer of 83. And that was a wonderful band. They had Timothy Schmidt from the Eagles on bass because the Eagles had broken up. For two years, we had the uh, Memphis Horns. And, you know, Jimmy had his own airplane and I would go in the back of the plane with, with the two guys, Andrew and Wayne. I say, okay, just tell me Otis Redding stories. <laughs> <laughs> And it was a wonderful band, very tight, very tight band. So I stayed with him till 80, 88. And then he, as Jimmy does, he, he made a bunch of changes. Mm -hmm. I got fired. Me and about four other guys. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have perhaps a story from that time? Yes, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a lot of fun. Well, Jimmy, luckily for me, that was 1983. And the L.A. scene was starting to dry up. I mean, I had played with a lot of the Southern California bands. And, um, and I was probably starting to wonder about my future and all that. And getting to be with Jimmy and be surrounded by him, I, I learned through osmosis uh, what it is again to just enjoy life. And, to, you know, that's it. he turned everything. You know, we had a lot of fun, a lot of fun with everybody. Got along with everybody in the band. It was a wonderful time. There's a very unusual, if you if you look at all of Jimmy Buffett's songs, there's a very unusual song that you have a, a co-writing credit, and it's on the Floor Days album. <laughs> yes. A lot of co-writers on this. You'll never work in this business again. Yes. Yeah. Can Can you tell us about this? Sure. Um, I had a wonderful experience where we we all came down to uh, Florida and recorded an album as a full band. Uh, and we had Ralph McDonald as well on, on uh, percussion. And oh gosh, Reggie Young on guitar as well as Josh. And we were having a blast. And Jimmy said that he called um, Josh and myself and maybe uh, Matt Benton, drummer who was a good song right? he said come on let's write a song for the album so we just went to his uh, his house and uh, set it up and you know wrote it in about 20 minutes but it never worked in this business again I was now living in Nashville and there's a whole little conversation at the end of the song between Jimmy and his manager and Jimmy never did he did his part I filled in for him so I was supposed to go to, uh, I'm in Nashville and get a call from Jimmy. He goes, ah, I can't make it to, Ma to Memphis. You just do my part. So on that album, I'm the manager and I'm doing Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> so it was, that was funny. You did a very convincing. Jimmy Buffett? Yeah, well, that's, I probably got in trouble a lot for imitating Buffett a lot. See, I was just a, <laughs> a mimic, a punk mimic. <laughs> glad that Dylan, Glenn Fry, once they got me in a room, says, Glenn says, Vince, I hear you, you can do me. I want to hear something. And I went, oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> you know. uh, sorry, Glenn, I, I don't think so. Yeah, that was funny. So, um, <laughs> so we had a good, we had a, a great time. I think that's how I got a lot of my gigs. I really was just an adequate keyboard player, but I got along with everyone and I was, you know, funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A lot, of, a lot of my work came my way. Who else can you mimic? Oh, I can mimic everyone. Yeah, or I shouldn't say everyone. I never wanted to and never did Donald Trump. Uh, I can do Rodney Dangerfield, uh, which, you know, I did play for Andy Kaufman. And Andy, uh -huh. Andy used to have a, um, an alter ego called Tony Clifton. Yeah. Who is this out of, you know, this guy with a powder blue tuxedo from New Jersey. Oh, how's everybody doing? You know, all that. So uh, we opened up for Rodney Dangerfield, but not as Andy Kaufman, but as Tony Clifton. So we, we uh, we're, we're rehearsing a few songs and then Andy leaves. And uh, Rodney comes here and goes, oh, hey, oh, this is the band. Okay. Uh, for once in a lifetime. And everyone going, oh, I said, we're we're rock musicians. We don't know. Well, what, you call yourself musicians. You don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> and so we had to learn Rodney Dangerfield show. So 
that's how I kind of did. You know, I was exposed to him for two nights, just, you know, he is exactly like that off stage. I don't know what you're doing. You know. <laughs> you're really good, Vince. Oh, thanks. What did you think of Andy Kaufman? He was, a, he was an interesting guy. Um, he was really an introvert off stage. And uh, he loved to see how riled up he can get the audience. He can get them to boo, leave, or, you know, someone challenge him to a fight. That was part of his whole thing was, you know, get the audience involved. So anytime he played in Los Angeles, I got to play, uh, accompany him on piano. So we do Andy Kaufman songs and we do Elvis. He did a great Elvis imitation. And uh, that's it. Hmm. You know, it, it, I was mentioning all of these different artists that you've worked with through the years, whether performing with them live or in the recording mm -hmm. studio. Mm -hmm. Is there somebody who comes to mind that really, really, they knocked you out in terms of what you learned from them or just in, in terms of their ability? Not necessarily in a studio, but I was very fortunate um, once I got out of college to back up Danny O'Keefe, who is a wonderful song. He's still a very close friend, a great songwriter. And also to back up J.D. Souther. And they influenced me as far as, you know, playing those songs every night and having the, the lyrics seep in and all that. They were very influential for me, not as far as imitating them, but just seeing what a good song is, how a good song is constructed. And then I, and actually, it was a wonderful thing for me to actually write with Danny O'Keefe and write with J.D. Souther, although one or two songs with J.D. But Danny is a, was a lot of fun. Still is a lot. I have to say one thing about J.D. Souther. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, journalists are kind of treated like, like garbage by mm -hmm. people. It's just like, you know, oh, you know, sorry, I was late. Of almost everybody I've interviewed, J.D. Souther treated me like I was a king or something. Really? That's great. He, he was so nice. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll never forget that. Mm -hmm. was, very, very nice guy. And I was close to him for, for years. Uh, then I moved to Nashville. He eventually moved to Nashville. Um, you know, and J.D. was very influential for me, um, especially the songwriting. And I had a lot of good, a lot of good times with him. A lot of fun. Great singer too. Oh yeah. 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 Well, Danny O'Keefe, I hope we can talk a little bit about him. It wasn't sure. long ago. He kind of made a cameo on the show. I was interviewing Steve Forbert and oh. Steve Forbert, uh, the recorded good time. Charlie's got the blues and Danny O'Keefe called in and it was really cool. Uh, but he just talked about how, he liked Steve's version of the song and Danny O'Keefe is, is just a great songwriter. Yes, he is. Yeah. He How'd you meet him? Um, my girlfriend at the time, I was playing clubs with our band, the Mug Bumps. We had just gotten out of college. We went on a six month tour backing up a uh, lounge singer, <laughs> wondering, is this, is this, is this our, is this the way it's going to end? And uh, my girlfriend, and then we played at a club in Westwood here and a girlfriend would come down to show and she was with um, Gibson and Stromberg, which was one of the first rock and roll PR firms. And Danny O'Keefe uh, had a hit with Good Time Charlie the year previous. And he just put a new album that Arif Mardin produced and it had everyone on it, Dr. John and, uh, oh gosh, what, what was his name? Where is the love uh, pianist? Uh, Hot Donny Hathaway. Yeah. And uh, Roger Calloway and people like that. So she said, you know, he needs to go on tour for, to promote this new album. I'll bring him down to the club. And he, you know, we met and everyone, everyone in that band was a, a clown, a goof up, but very, but good musicians, those, the rest of the guys. And so we went on tour with him and ended up living right next door to him in the Hollywood Hills. Um, in the 70s, yeah. There is a song that you wrote with Danny O'Keefe 
that he recorded. And for everyone out there who is interested, there's also a version that you can find that uh, Jimmy Buffett recorded. Yeah. Souvenirs. Mm -hmm. And there have been a couple of people who have told me that that's one of their favorite songs. Yeah. I'm hoping you, yeah, yeah. I'm hoping you can tell us what, what inspired that beautiful song. With Danny O'Keefe, I strictly wrote the music. So when Danny would come to Nashville, um, either I would present him with a little track and sing a melody, and then Danny would come back with a lyric, or Danny would give me a lyric, and I would write music to it. I never, I never felt that it was my place, because Danny's really a poet. And I didn't want to go, well, Danny, what you really meant by this is, you know, <laughs> kind of critique. And I did a very, very occasionally if we were writing for Nashville, only because, you know, I, I knew the rules and, and the do's and don'ts. So I wish I had an exciting story of how we wrote it, but it was probably either me doing the music or Danny bringing me the lyric. And Buffett loved it, but he, uh, and it was a wonderful track, but I just, Jimmy, I don't think he went in and did a final uh, vocal on that. It didn't sound like it. Mm. I didn't know Danny recorded it. Yeah, yeah, he did. Oh, great, great. Very cool. Yeah, thank you. There's about four or five songs Danny and I have written together that uh, have yet to see the light of day. And Randy Travis cut one, but he, it was one of those stories that was the last cut of the day and it just came out. They didn't refine it and so it didn't go on the album hmm. Danny's what, what a talent well what you just mentioned about Randy Travis I think that's a actually a good point one thing that almost everybody has stories in the music business of is disappointment hmm. like I especially songwriters I've heard so many horror stories like you know Johnny Cash says he's going to record this he doesn't record it and, and it's like, or even worse sometimes, I don't know what's worse. I've heard many, many stories of the the artist, this iconic singer records this song, never releases it. The writer doesn't even get to hear it. Right. What is the best way to handle disappointment? Well, you, being a songwriter, you should be used to it because probably for the, you know, in Nashville, you write a lot of songs. So let's say I write 60 songs a year. I should probably only expect two or three to be cut, unless I'm the one that they say, give me a Vince Melamed song, you know. But by then, uh, any good songwriter should be seasoned enough to know that there's gonna be plenty of disappointments. And that has helped me in the voiceover. You know, I probably do about six or seven auditions a day and I walk away from it. And I sometimes get shortlisted, but I don't immediately go, I got this gig. And hmm. that's what songwriters <laughs> will do too. Because, you know, in Nashville, they call it a hold. So if they said Willie Nelson was going to record their song, they probably got a hold with Willie Nelson, which is also bad for writers because a hold doesn't mean, it's not like in, in, in TV and, and in movies, if you write a script, they will give you an option and they'll pay you $50,000 to hold on to it for six months. And if they don't record it, if they don't record it, if they don't make a movie out of it, don't put it in, you keep your money and you get your script rights back. But in music, your song's put on hold, especially in Nashville. And if the song's on hold, it may be on hold for a year. So thus you're not supposed to plug it somewhere else and you may have lost a great opportunity because your song was on hold. But my song, Walk Away Joe, um, was written in like 1991 and the Judds we're going to do one more album and they put the song on hold. They recorded their album. So you have to wait to, you know, they record the album. So five or six months later, oh, we didn't record that one. So then Winona is going to put her solo album out and they put it on hold. So you're waiting another eight, nine months. I'm sorry, I've got this messed up. Trisha Yearwood put it on hold because Garth Fundus, her producer at the time, had heard us sing it at the Bluebird, uh, the songwriter and I, the other songwriter, Greg Barnhill, is a wonderful singer. Puts it on hold for Trisha Yearwood. Then Winona says, you know that song, Walk Away Joe? I know we were put on hold for the jazz. I want to record it. So he, he took it, my publisher took it away from, from uh, 
Trisha, and she did her first album. Winona didn't record the song, and now Trisha's got a big hit where she's in love with the boy, and it's time to do her second album. So only a publisher would have the balls to do this week. He went back to Garth and said, hey, you know that song, Love Boy Joe's available now. And it was the luckiest thing that happened to me because the second album is so much more mature and so much more artistic as far as not her singing. She was always a great singer. But the first album was just a typical Nashville kind of thing. The second album, and this is a songwriter saying, you know, we, we write Walk Away Joe and we do the demo just in my little studio. And I said, no keyboards. Let's do all guitar, no keyboards. And we write this stupid bridge. And it ends up being recorded. And it's um, Matt Rawlings, who I know you've interviewed. Matt Rawlings, it's all a piano song. <laughs> so the, <laughs> there's a joke in Nashville used to be what's the most unwelcome thing in a recording studio. And it's the songwriter. Because they'll always say, oh, it has to go. It's not, that's not the way, you know. Huh. So if that sheds any light for you on the interesting yeah well vince what would you say to anybody out there who has an aspiration they have a dream you, you've accomplished so many things if you're it, it's really it's tougher now you know i was so lucky as a keyboard player because la was so much smaller if you were out of a gig like i was with bobby womack and for two years and left europe and immediately I flew in like Monday morning and immediately got up and went to the Troubadour Monday night because Monday night at the Troubadour was the big hang. And that's how I got my J.D. Southard gig. There was, you knew where to go. You, if you're young, you, can, you should go out and show your face because no one's going to come knocking on your door. You have to create your own opportunity. And even, and I truly mean this, I'm just an adequate keyboard player, but when Womack said, you know, yeah, all right, why don't you come up to my house and, uh, you know, uh, and we'll, we'll jam. Well, luckily, he didn't call me for three weeks. In the meantime, I went and bought every one of his albums and charted all that stuff out because I wanted to be prepared when it, when it was called up to the house. And that's another thing. You, it has, has to do with being at the right place at the right time, but then having the talent and the luck and then having the talent to back up the luck, you know. Anybody who wants more information, you can go to vincemillamed.com, <laughs> M-E-L-A-M-E-D. Yep. I always like to end the show, it's like an open forum, an, an open stage. There's people watching or listening from anywhere in the world. What would you say to anybody who's tuned in? Uh, let's try a little harder to uh, all get along. <laughs> <laughs> that was what I would say. And uh, let's, especially with COVID, let's just follow the rules for a little bit so that we finally can be free. <laughs> yeah. And if I dare extend it to say, wearing a mask shouldn't be that much of a problem for someone. If you're going out in public, just think of the other person and especially Think of the people that work in hospitals. They've been doing this for a year. They are completely worn down and worn out. And let's at least do it for them. And Vince, is there anything on the horizon with you that people should know about? Well, at two o'clock, I'm doing a Roberto's Taco ad for Las Vegas. <laughs> but I'm also doing the Spanish, which is strange because... I only took five years. I took five years of Spanish in school and I don't speak it all the time, but they insist that I do it. So that's it. And I just did a commercial yesterday and I hope to do that more often. And my wife and I plan to move to Ventura sometime. Okay. Have a quieter existence. That'll be nice. Yeah. Well, it was a Vince, pleasure. this has been a pleasure. You're a great raconteur. Oh, thank you. And you have a great voice to match it. Thank you. So, you're welcome back anytime. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. You bet. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye. We'll see you soon. See you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.